Today, we're taking a look at this new book by Chuck Israels and all the lessons learned over the past half century plus of his bass playing, all about the trio and much more in this video. Let's dive in. I've had the good fortune to spend time with Chuck over the years. It's one of the cool benefits about the work I do is getting to interact with significant figures in the world of double bass like Chuck. We sat down last summer to do an interview for my podcast. During that interview, he dropped the news about this book. I wrote a book. Yeah. It's coming out in the fall. I went on Amazon and pre-ordered it, and it's available in hardcover or Kindle. That is linked up in the description. So let's get into Bass Notes, Jazz in American Culture, A Personal View by Chuck Israels. I have gone through this entire book and taken notes, and I just love everything about Chuck's writing. I've always enjoyed his writing, as well as his bass playing, certainly, but just very articulate and thoughtful player, musician, and thinker on music and double bass and jazz and its role in culture over the years. When you write a book, you better pay attention and get it right. So he starts off describing the way that he found himself playing with Bill Evans and there are wonderful uh, photographs and uh, letters and reminiscences throughout this book. Chuck saved all of this, which is just very cool. And certainly the fact that Chuck played with Bill for so many years in one of the iterations of Bill's trio uh, taking over the bass chair for Scott LaFaro after he died, you know, that is certainly sprinkled throughout the book, but there's much more than just Bill Evans in this book, though that that is absolute gold in here. Right here in the intro, we start off with how it came to be that Chuck found himself playing with Bill Evans. Chuck digs into his early years and the musical background and this really interesting uh, milieu of artistry and influences that surrounded him growing up. I grew up in a, in a musical family. My mother married a, a classical baritone who was a wonderful musician and he was politically active, and so I, in, in our house, musicians and political people were coming through all the time. Paul Robeson was my kid brother's godfather. Uh, that Pete Seeger was in the house all the time. So I, I was supplied with a, with a childhood background that actually, it made me think I wasn't going to be a musician because all of those people were so well developed and I was a kid and I, I'll never be able to do that. But in fact, it did prepare me to be listening to interesting things and to be open-minded to, to music and, and finally deeply affected or infected with it <laughs> to the point that... that uh, to the point that I went to MIT thinking that was the conventional thing to do to take advantage of my interest in engineering and mathematics and physics, and then found out that, no, I really, I really didn't belong there. <laughs> and it took me a while, but anyhow, so that's my background. He got into the scene in Boston, the jazz scene, and found himself coming to a crossroads where MIT and the academics were not compatible with the jazz uh, world that he was getting into. And he's very self-reflective about his uh, abilities at the time and how certain things came easy and hard work wasn't really something that he had discovered, at least in terms of the bass and music at this point. And I'm particularly excited about this book because I've just enjoyed Chuck's writing over the years. He has many articles that he's written over the years on his website, and I read them all before I first interviewed him years and years ago. And to put this down like this in this uh, complete story about how he got into music and his time with Bill and beyond is just very insightful. I love these letters that he saved and these uh, reminiscences, just very cool from the 50s. I love some of these photos of how this is 1957 with Chuck and some colleagues playing. Look at that. In the late 50s, he found himself heading to Paris playing with Bud Powell, then truly entering the profession here at the beginning of the 60s. You know, all these things that you're, you're talking about, a lot of them have to do with the, the zeitgeist, the, the cultural atmosphere in which I grew up, and the particular social conditions that put me in contact with things that worked their magic on me to produce a person interested and active in, in this way. And I see the circumstances 
uh, of the young people now that I, and they ask me questions about this, uh, and I see they have a lot of advantages that we didn't have in terms of access to the internet and all that, all that stuff that's available, but I also see that it's terribly confusing compared to the time I grew up. Mm -hmm. I wasn't mm -hmm. so confused. There was popular music and jazz and they were mostly the same thing. There was all this classical music and I gravitated to this and everybody was trying to play more or less the same way and you could make a living playing that way. Now, in order to make a living, if you want to be a jazz musician, you have to do all kinds of other stuff that is, that is in a way antithetical to the aesthetics that attracted me in the first place. Mm -hmm. And Chuck captures the relevance that jazz had to just everyday society uh, very well in this book. It's something that here in 2024, as I film this video, it's sort of easy to forget just how different a role jazz played in the early 60s, late 50s, and wow, it sounds like a cool era. I wish, <laughs> wish I had gotten a chance to experience that. It's amazing how many prominent musicians Chuck worked with over the years, and I love reading about everybody from Bud Powell to certainly Bill Evans to Gunther Schuller. Then, chapter six, we get into playing with Bill Evans and just what that was like. And Chuck has talked to me about that and talked to many people about that. But to put it down here on paper as just a great way to just sort of think about what it must have been like to work with such an incredible artist and just how that changed Chuck's playing and what a pivotal and monumental figure Bill Evans really was in the jazz world. What it was like playing with Bill was easy. And that's... And... The reason it was easy was because he was so strong. Mm -hmm. It's strong to be, it, it's easy to be carried by a strong musician. He was, um, uh, well, uh, there's a lot about it. There's also the kind of unspoken, consensual, synergistic agreement about how things go. And the best jazz music is, in a way, a model for a synergistic system in which what is good for the individual is good for the group, and what's good for the group is good for the individual. And that's kind of an idealistic uh, Abraham Maslow concept uh, that we, we aim for that. And it's not easy to achieve it. And, you know, our governmental constitution tried to, tried to figure that out. I don't know who wrote the jazz constitution. No one person. It's just, it's consensual. So when all that consensus, consensus comes together, whew, works for everybody because nobody's the boss. Mm -hmm. And yet we all kind of agree it's going to go like this or like this. And you've got room here. And oh, that, that's that guy's space. And working with Bill was, to get back to that, to that aspect of it, he was a, a master of so many things and so comfortable within the, this kind of big space of how do you make this music work, that you could, you, you could go this way or you could lean that way or you could... And, Whatever you did, there was a way of accommodating it in that music. I also have to say that I never came into that music thinking about breaking it or at at that time i I wasn't thinking about how am I going to play? I was thinking about. How am I going to insert myself into this music? And, it, and when I say I was thinking about it, it doesn't mean I was calculating it. That's just how I felt about it and what 
what I was impelled and compelled to do. I wanted to bathe in that lake, you know. <laughs> so, and Bill, uh, he really made it easy. If I made a mistake, he ignored it. If I did something good, he incorporated it. it was <laughs> so in that sense, it was very easy. And it was prepared, it was, he was well prepared. It's something maybe that people don't know about that music is how carefully prepared his parts were in such a way that you could find your way to attach a, a, an empathetic coordinating part to that because you knew it was going to go like that and you knew if the, that if there were, a ch were to be a change in it, it would be a spontaneous accommodation that would maybe shift something a little bit, but that the overall thrust of the piece was going to, that was how that piece, he had prepared it, made it his. I wanted to be in that. So I loved it. The rhythmic explorations that, that Bill had in his music and that Chuck experienced and collaborated on with him, that's the, one of the takeaways that I get from reading this. The National Jazz Ensemble, which is a very cool uh, ensemble, kind of taking an orchestral approach, a repertory approach, as he describes it here, to uh, the jazz canon and what that was like. I've been chasing that goal for the rest of my life, only I've been trying to do it with bigger ensembles and other instrumental colors and uh, and occasionally some idea that doesn't spring exactly from from that but that's I haven't abandoned that aesthetic I, I it satisfied me for as long as I can remember that's a look at bass notes from Chuck Israels check out the book in the description below and we'll see you in the next one <laughs> Thank you.